or for those that didn't miss, didn't make it tonight, welcome back to the video. You can watch it online. And we'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, anybody else have any big questions about uh, what you're going through or what you're seeing or what, uh, what you got before we, we start running? We're good. We're good. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Um, amateur radio is a huge uh, ball. We do a ton of things. Um, we are licensed by the FCC and we have to get this license by taking a test and, and passing a class and all that good stuff or passing a, a test. Tomorrow night, we'll actually be giving that class. Um, I don't know if any of you, have anybody studied ahead and you're ready to go take the test? No. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> I didn't think so. Um, but, th but the idea is that we will, um, uh, you get a license and then you're allowed to communicate and build your own radios. We're probably one of the few places you can actually build your own radio as, yeah. um, as a, uh, a licensed legal piece and not go to jail for, uh, for putting stuff on the air. Ken, the instructor from about four or five weeks from now is actually building a radio from, um, uh, from scratch that he's putting together that uh, he got a little kit from Ukraine. So uh, we'll, I'm sure he'll talk about that when he's doing his thing. Let me get my little screen shared here. Click this button. That should get it. Yeah. Now let's move down the web page. Um, I don't know. I, I know that, that Lee sent you some information out. Um, but I just want to make sure that we go through the little website, uh, our website piece, um, so that you can use it to help the class. Our, our uh, club website is W5NOR. Whiskey 5 is the prefix that we use here in this part of the country. And the NOR is for Norman, W5NOR.org. And that's where everything lives. Um, you, I think, went to a, a, we sent you to a class, uh, the one that said um, class. Uh, w5nor.org slash class and that will get you all of the good important information uh, amateur radio classes is on the little drop down menu that um, that you should see here and <clears throat> hopefully since you're here you've made it to the technician class there's a lot of information on this uh, class page that will help you learn the information that you're, you're uh, going to need. One of them is you'll need an FCC, what they call FRN number or FCC registration number. It is a required number and th the FCC now requires you to get that number. And it's more important because you don't want the other option which is you have to give me your social security number and I'm an IT guy and I really would like somebody's new social security number to go play with. So when we get to the point or if you're available now or, or sometime in the future, if you click this link for FCC cores, that will let you build a login and a, um, an FRN number and that's how you'll take the test uh, based on that. So uh, we'll have to do it before we get to the end of the class but if you want to sign up now, you're welcome to go do that. And um, you may have one. Uh, is there any G GMRS, Global or General Mobile Radio Service people on board? Nobody's got the GMRS license? Nope. Okay. I don't think so, but this is also in the letter I sent out. Uh, oh, okay. Good, 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 good. Good. Very good. Very good. Um, the... Uh, uh, so you get that FRN number and that's how we, we keep your social security number safe. Uh, there's online practice, which has all of the questions. Um, I assume, Lee, that we have books to all these people. Is that a fair assumption? That is a very fair assumption. <laughs> very good. Um, they, uh, uh, these books um, have all of the test questions in the back. And that is actually the test questions that you will use. You will see those exact same questions and those exact same answers on the test. There's no trickery. There's no nothing. It's simply, if you simply memorize that book, you're ready to pass the test. I know we got a teacher on board, so don't listen. But, <laughs> but we encourage you to cram for the test and, and take this to pass the test. Because the day you get your license, is the day you start learning. Um, and once you get that license, before you get the license, you're kind of afraid and scared and you don't, uh, you wanna make sure you get everything done 
correctly and you forget the actual content that's here. So we'll be around afterwards to help you with content, but work on getting the test passed. And one of the ways you can do that is these um, online practice places, and you can actually click on them. And let me see, right? Uh, um, click on one of those questions. Uh, you can do a practice test, log in. And if you do a login, it will let you track your progress over time. So it will, it will read you the questions. Uh, it will put the, the questions out and then it will um, grade the test as you go through it. So here's the question. And this is for the extra test, so it's not for you guys, don't panic. What's the modulation index of an FM signal? And you have an A, B, C, or a D answer. You click that and it will go on to the next question and give you the next one. So these are the exact questions that you will see. Not paraphrased, not different, sort of. They are the actual word for word questions. Um, that's it's usually what everybody gets panicked over. What's the test? What's the test? What's the test? Um, we, we do these tests typically every um, first Thursday of the month, and we will offer tests at the end of this uh, event. Depending on how many people are involved, we'll schedule around what your schedules are, but it takes three of us to be there to be testers, and then you can just take the test and go. Um, costs are nothing. There are no fees. The book is the only thing you have to pay for. Everything else is free, which is cool. They're talking about adding a $50 fee uh, for the license um, sometime in the next year. But for right now, it is still free. It is your federal government at work. That's Congress. It's not, everybody tries to blame the FCC, but it's Congress. Congress got greedy. Mm. Hard, hard to believe. Um, uh, SCARS Technician Class Online 2020, this is the class that you folks are in. Hopefully you clicked on the Zoom link to get us here, or you did the number, or you did the YouTube. Uh, there's a stream for the YouTube. Or you can actually click to click on the play button and you'll join us live. There will be each week one of these video boxes that appears in each week's syllabus that shows up on the, on the screen now. But it, it says we're out week one, which is me as the instructor, there's the date, and there will be a place there. So we'll have that video in place. So if you miss a class or if you forget something or if the phone rings and you have to go do something else, you can always come back to it. Um, if you can't get in by a, um, uh, if you can't get in, you wanna be live, you can join by just a telephone number only, which is kind of cool. So that gets you how do you get in the, uh, each, each week is listed in place here. Week one is where we are now. That's me as the instructor. The date, I will add the video link as, as the videos come up. And we have a link to the PowerPoint slides that you have for each night. And they're available as a PDF. So that if you don't have PowerPoint, you will have access to those slides in a PDF format. So if you want to go back and look at something, all of that stuff's there waiting for you. Also, and they're all, uh, Lee, are they all on the Buck book? Yes. Okay. Yes, everybody has the Buck book. Okay. Um, so the, uh, uh, the Buck book has, let me go back over there to nr.org slash tech. And in each one of the weeks, you will see the word Buck Book, and that's the book that you have. This tells you the chapters in the book that we're going to talk about each week. So that Buck Book, uh, did it drop my video out? Yes, it dropped my video out. Why did it drop me out? Screen one, share. Well, where did it go? Stand well, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Let's go this way. There it is. Don't know why it went away, but it's gone now. It's better now. Um, 
in this portion that says buck book is that these are the chapters that are going to be talked about in that book. Um, they don't have numbers, they have names. So that says the introduction and how to study and how I got started and all those are chapters in that book that you have. I'm going to say nobody has read anything out of the book. Is that a fair statement? Yes. <laughs> That's the way. Um, as you go along, read these. Uh, tonight, you obviously uh, are given a free pass because you, you, don't, you didn't know what to go look at. But um, read those for next week. And in the second week, they have these chapters. So this will get you ready for Phil and Ron's uh, part next week. That's bands and frequencies, modes of operation, FM radio, AM radio, and all that kind of stuff. So if you read those chapters in that book, that will get you up to speed. The book you have is a good book. It is not, it is not a PhD level book. It is a book that will get you through to the test. And if you'll, if you follow through the whole thing, you'll understand our goal is to get you through the test. So um, there are plenty of references, plenty of stuff. If you need more information and follow up all over the web, you can Google it or we offer what we call Elmer night, which is every Tuesday night, we meet on this same exact Zoom. And if you have questions, 6.30 to nine, um, the same exact Zoom, you can come back in and just ask any questions and, and get caught up or do anything you wish. So um, read up and if you get behind, feel free to jump into the question on the uh, Tuesday night, we can do one-on-one -on -one and get you up and running. There's another book called the ARRL book, which is the amateur, the American Radio Relay League. And this is their chapter. So if you happen to get that book or you know somebody that's got that book, they can follow along with the same information, just laid out a little bit different on it. In each week, there's a thing called a test sub element. And these are the tests that actually um, we will talk about this, this piece. You don't really care, but this, the goal here is that's what you'll learn to, to meet the test. Those are the sections that we'll test you on. Don't let the math scare you. Right. Don't let Ron and Phil scare you. That's the, the, everybody sucks air on the second week and the third week. And, and we'll get you back on, on the fourth, fifth, and sixth. But the first two are uh, radio waves and how the waves and frequencies and all that kind of stuff goes. Um, and then the second one is on electronic circuits. You don't have to build anything. We tell people, even if you ignore all of one of the two nights, you'll still pass the test. You can, you know, you can miss one whole night, so don't panic. Hang on, you'll get it, no problem. So PDFs, PowerPoints are there. And uh, the most important one is next week's, there's something called a band plan. And there's a little downloadable, it says a band plan download. That download um, is something you probably ought to get uh, Phil says get and memorize. I don't think you'll need to memorize it. But the idea is this gives you a list of the frequencies um, that, that we're allowed to use. This is the places that we can use radio. And this is something that is testable. Um, for instance, this is what's called an 80 meter. You'll learn about that next week. Um, it's from 3.5 3, uh, 3 megahertz to 4 megahertz. And the different classes, there's one that says E for extra class, which is the top level class. And A is the advanced class. G is the general. And the technician, which is the class that you guys are operating. So each one of those lines tells you where you can operate. So a technician can operate from 3.525 to 3.6 megahertz. And what they do is they'll test you on the endpoints of that. So as you're looking at them, uh, you can look at the, the frequencies and, and get kind of familiar with where they are. Phil and them will talk about it in more detail, but that's something that you want to start looking at. That's kind of a neat thing. All of them stop at a round number, you know, four megahertz here over on the top right is one uh, 40 meters that says 7.3 megahertz. Um, so they're all round numbers, but uh, those are good ones, easy ones to, if you're a memory person, those are easy questions to get correct on those. So grab that band plan and either print it out or look at it sometime throughout the week. That would be a good thing. That would be a real good thing. Um, what else do we have? Band plan. The rest of that is, is the, uh, 
the different weeks. Week three is talks about electrical components, circuits like serial and parallel circuits, if you're familiar with those words. If not, you will be. Volts, ohms, amps, and power, resistors, capacitors, all those kind of little technical things. So you'll know what's inside your radio. Week four, Ken Sanborn, who's on the call, is uh, going to talk about radio waves, propagations, and antennas, and all that kind of good stuff. That's a fun one. So if you make it through Phil and Ken, then four is going to be a breeze, not a problem. So hang tight. You'll get them. A lot of cool demos in next week's stuff, so you'll be in good shape. Week five, Bill Lockett will talk to you about operating practices and how to set up a radio, uh, conversations, and... and um, uh, cleaning up the signal, how you can change filtering and do those kind of things. Lee, which you all know, is going to be talking about uh, some of the fun different modes, how you can communicate with folks doing nets. Um, that's something that you guys is, as uh, mostly uh, emergency, uh, emergency management kind of uh, radios or communications for emergencies. We have a lot of local nets. We do Tuesday night nets and um, you can actually listen in on those nets. Either if you have a scanner, you can listen in, or I'll show you where you can pull it off the website. You can actually listen live um, to that if you want to listen to those nets. There's a lot of fun to check into, and they they uh, uh, they let you learn about the local folks and communicate, and more importantly, practice. You can practice with your equipment. You can practice with the uh, uh, battery systems or backups as you wish to. And they're really great places to, to test your communication skills and learn new ones as you go through. And then the last one is Galen Kitt. She's emergency manager from the city of Moore. And he will do operating regulations, more, more rules and regs, and safety, how you take care of mainly don't fall off a ladder and don't touch in transmitting antenna is the main thing there. But that will uh, keep you safe in your operations. At the very bottom of this page, there's uh, the books. You have the Craig Buck book manual and the uh, ARRL book that are listed there. So you have a book manual. You're in good shape on that one. I will show. Let me get back to the main page. Not that main page that main page. At the very bottom of the main page, it'll show you all kinds of cool stuff. We have a group of YLs, or we call them young ladies. You'll hear about different uh, abbreviations. These gals all went out to the batfish that was over in Muskogee. And it was a, is a submarine that's over there in, in Muskogee. And it used to sit in this little pond that you see there. But during the floods of last year, it picked itself up and moved itself over. Um, they go out there and uh, once a year, usually in October, and they operate from the batfish and they use their amateur radio skills and they put, typically put up about three transmitters and these ladies all operate, set it all up, operate and do it all themselves wow. and, and have a blast. A uh, really good bunch of ladies, they're good gals. Uh, weather service is something we do with. There's our license testing that, that I said was Tuesday. It's tomorrow night. Got to remember to go over there and, and do that thing. And then at the very bottom, if we have something called VHF audio on the web. And the idea is we have a, uh, we have an internet connection that you can actually listen to what's going on on the, uh, the radios locally. And uh, you can pick it up and just uh, hit the play button and you'll play um, whatever's coming out on the radio. So before you bless you, Thank before you. you get <laughs> before you get a radio, you can actually listen to what's happening local um, on our meetings page. We talk about when those meetings, those uh, meetings happen. You'll see um, meetings page. We'll have all of the local meetings, whether we're uh, on the air or back in the day when we were allowed to meet together. Um, there's the Daily McNet that Lee is one of the big driving forces behind. And they get on at nine o'clock local every day on that same repeater radio. And, and they'll check in. I don't know, what are you doing, Lee, nowadays? 30 people, 25, 30 still on? Uh, lately, it's been running in the 30s. Yeah, it's wow. been great. Wow. So you can, you can hear a bunch of stuff if you click that 
that link at nine o'clock in the morning, you'll hear these guys chatting away, doing their thing. Um, and then all the rest of the meetings that happen throughout the week uh, are listed on that, on that webpage. So a lot of stuff once you get going um, and you'll, you'll uh, be able to take off and run. A lot of information there. If you want to get advanced, go ahead, do all your, do all your stuff. It's a lot of fun. Uh, okay, let's get through our little slides deck for the evening. Any questions at this point? Are we still flowing okay? Nobody's complaining. That's good. Um, the, today's stuff, we're supposed to be doing some introduction and talk about things. These are our instructors for the group. You've met uh, Ron and um, you've met Ken and Lee and myself. But these are going to be your instructors, uh, all volunteer instructors. None of us get paid. One of the bad things about amateur radio is you can't be paid. There's no way to be paid for your service. This is an amateur radio service, so nothing is commercial. Um, we'll talk about it. Lee, I think, is the one that talks about that, is that you can't do anything commercial on this stuff. Emergencies, um, you know, you can, emergencies are not commercial stuff. But if you're trying to run a business over this radio, not what you're here for but it didn't sound like anybody had that inkling. Um, I'm, I've been around forever. Phil Senate is, works at the FAA. Him and Ron do the, the piece next week on frequencies and bandwidth and uh, get you going on, uh, on that kind of stuff. Ken Goodson, um, been a ham forever and works with me and he'll do all the electrical circuits pieces and let you talk about all those kind of stuff. Ken Sandburn talks about antennas and radios, uh, antennas and propagation. Propagation is the piece that lets that signal go from here, for those of you that said CB stuff, and skip across the world or the country. And that's how we actually do long distance communications is we bounce off of the atmosphere. So Ken will talk to you about that. Bill's been a long-term ham, been uh, talked to you about the operations of radios, and then Lee um, and Galen will finish that piece up. So that's the, four, the eight of us that do this. Uh, we did this piece, which is the introductions earlier. We'll skip by that piece. Um, we will allegedly start and end on time. You all been around long enough to know that we'll start and end pretty much on time. Uh, the, 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 we will be prepared for each topic. That's our goal for you. So your goal for us is to make sure that you have the stuff ready before you get here. Um, that's always worked out better. You know, if you can't make it, don't skip a class because you haven't read up. Show up anyway. Nobody's, nobody's, but uh, Cody might slap your hands, but well, we won't. Um, and then amateur radio is not a spectator sport. Um, active participation in the class, A, is vital. And B, once you get out in the amateur radio world, it's, you know, it's typically something that you, you have to do something with. You've got to pick up that radio and press the key bound and talk. And uh, once you do that, you start learning about how you can do more and more stuff every day. And, and that's very, very successful. It makes you a very successful amateur radio operator. So stay involved, be involved, do all that kind of good stuff. Uh, we talked about all the overview stuff already. I got that one out of order, I guess. So the idea is we're going to get started. Um, our goal for, for this class is to get you what we call a technician class amateur radio license. There are three licenses, a technician, a general, and an extra class. And we are gonna get you the first one to help you get that technician class. Um, it will let you get on the local radios, the small little radios that, that will transmit locally. If you're wanting to do more long distance work, like those of you who had relatives that did this in the past, uh, you should probably stick around and get your general license. Um, that license lets you talk farther and all around the, the, the globe. Um, and literally around the globe. Uh, we've got guys this week who've talked to Europe and Asia and all kinds of stuff. Uh, Australia, kind of fun. I was talking to Italy last week. Oh, were you? Yeah. On what band? Uh, 40 meters. Wow. And that's a, that's... a little radio that he's talking about, a little bow, it's called a Bofang. Little, it's a little handheld two meter radio. Yep. Um, so we do, we do uh, personal radio services. We're authorized by the FCC. We have to have that license. We're here to in, uh, advance the art of radio and science. That's why we teach you how to build stuff. 
uh, we are the we were the folks and are the folks that have generated a lot of the uh, advancement electronics over the years. Um, a lot of the internet work stuff were done by hams. A lot of the space stuff is done by hams. Hams. Uh, we have our own satellites that actually go around the world um, in satellite um, uh, around the world to provide uh, communications. And uh, we actually have uh, hams as astronauts who are on the space station. So we can talk to the space station um, it, as they go overhead. And that's a lot of fun. We just literally put up a, uh, we as the society put up a repeater radio station that's on the, the ISS. So whenever it's overhead, you can bounce a signal up off of that radio in the space station and then back to earth and, um, and make that kind of thing happen. Um, so, so we're trying to advance that stuff and we got a lot of folks that are doing a good job to make that happen. Uh, we want to be a, a pool of trained radio operators. Um, there are technically, you've all had cell phones long enough to understand there are people that ho have cell phones and there are people that can communicate with a cell phone. It takes a big skill to actually pass traffic instead of being the one to run around with your phone and saying, what's the number to 911? What's the number to 911? That's not the, the guys we're talking about. We're talking about trained radio folks that know how to take information and pass it on to the next stuff. Emergencies are a really good way to, to flesh out who's good and who's bad. And we're supposed to be here to promote international goodwill. Like, like uh, Lee said, he was talking to Italy. I don't know that he's our best ambassador to Italy. Are you, Lee? <laughs> Italian. <laughs> Italian, okay. But the idea is we want to we want to communicate and and uh, we do a very good job because we can talk to our signals can go across the world. We have to be able to ambassador to the rest of the world. So um, it's it's kind of fun to be able to talk to some of these smaller countries all over the world and, and uh, like they're next door. It's it's pretty pretty nifty, pretty nifty. Uh, amateur radio service is governed for those. I think we had a lawyer on the on the panel, so we will say that this is part 97 of the FCC rules and regulations. So if you hear somebody say uh, part 97 says that's the actual rules and regulations, you can go look them up. They're on this, the club website, and uh, they're literally the the rules that FCC and Congress have put together. So um, we have to follow those rules. Uh, anybody can be a ham amateur radio operator. Um, you cannot be a foreign operative, I guess is the only piece of that, but I don't think anybody here is. There is no age limit, either young or old. If you can pass the test, young or old, you can, uh, you can get an amateur radio license. We have had nine-year-olds pass the same test that you're going to take, and they have passed the second and third tests as well. So um, uh, young isn't a problem. And uh, the oldest ham it was 199, who just, or 109, not 109, 109 years old. He just passed away last month. So we're trying to figure out who the next oldest guy was. He was the last Iwo Jima um, survivor, and he was also a amateur radio operator. So really neat guy. Um, and here's the piece. Ham operators can't accept payment uh, of any type. It should be any type for operating your radio. So the idea is if you're, if you're doing this for money, you're in the wrong place. Um, there is, since we have a teacher, I'll say it, there is a hole that says, if you wish to teach amateur radio in a classroom as a teacher, um, you can get paid as your normal teaching salary um, and that that's not a problem. So people were worried about that, but they did make a hole for people, teachers that are doing this kind of thing. and. Um, that the can and then I think the other thing they did was astronauts. They excluded astronauts because they're getting paid while they're up in space. Uh, what do we do? Communicate. We don't always do it well, but we try really, really hard. Uh, we experiment. There's a bunch of us. Once you get involved, you typically start taking the radio apart and saying, "I can do it better," or maybe it doesn't go back together. But you you play with it. We build pieces. Mm -hmm. There are tons of kits. We offer a bunch of those. We have some little $10 kits that let you solder stuff. And um, we, everything from uh, little tiny radios that you can transmit on or uh, Morse code or for $10 or a uh, antenna that you can build up that you can use for your, uh, your little radios like Lee was talking about. We compete. We have a uh, competitive nature. We have contests. 
um, where we try to make as many contacts uh, with other hams across the country or the world or the, or the state, depending on what the contest is. Um, and we serve our communities. Uh, Lee and I do a lot of, of uh, work with the emergency services people. Uh, when there's a storm, Lee is probably sitting in the chair uh, at the emergency um, services place, uh, emergency operations center here in Norman. And uh, I'm on the radio somewhere. We do uh, uh, siren tests every Saturday at noon. They blow the sirens and we have am hams all over the central Oklahoma. We run the, uh, uh, the testing reporting for Moore, Norman, Noble, and Newcastle. So we uh, take care of all those four places. Think about, about 300 different sirens is what we've got scattered around. They're on the website if you want to chase it. And then my other statement, we engage in lifelong learning. So your license to learn is what you're going to get with this piece. What makes amateur radio different? I think none of you have any past history. Um, FRS is the family radio system, and that's the little radios you buy at Walmart that you can communicate with your family. Those radios have more restrictions. For instance, you cannot change out the antenna on one of those, and you cannot increase the power on those. So as an amateur radio operator, those family radios are nice, but we have better power systems and we have better antennas so we can communicate farther. There's another one called GMRS, which is out there that has similar restrictions. Um, they cannot build their own equipment. They have to use commercial equipment and they can only be used for uh, emergency services kind of activities. So we have less restrictions, more ways to talk to people and it's free to operate our radio. So for now, until it charges, yeah, it's five bucks a year. It's not a big deal. So I'm sure the hams will complain, but we'll get over it. Uh, with privileges gets more responsibility. Ham radios are more capable. We have a lot more power that we can actually do. Um, Lee is one of these guys that runs, what are you up to, 1,500 watts, Lee? I'm working on one that's 1,500. Right now I'm running about 700. 700 watts and... If you think that your little handy talkie, your little phone that has your pocket is probably two tenths of a watt, um, his radio is going to way outdo your little uh, You don't cell grab phone. my antenna. Yeah, you don't want to touch the antenna. You don't want to do a lot of things when you're in those areas. So we have a lot more power. We can interfere, interfere with other radio systems and more importantly, TV stations. Uh, back in the day when we used to get our TV over the air, used to be the worst part of that where we would interfere with our neighbors televisions but uh, typically our stations are operated correctly and it's the other receiving equipment that has problems however the neighbors usually don't understand that very well and um, there's some issues we have technical service teams that will help you if you get into one of those situations that, that will help you deal with a neighbor and uh, we've resolved every problem we've ever had so not a big deal uh, we have, and it says unlimited reach and really is, uh, Lee was talking to Italy, he said, and if you can't, if you looked at a globe, that's pretty much halfway around the world. Um, so our communications can, can interfere if we do them improperly uh, with other countries, and you'd hate to be the guy that started an international incident. Not a good thing. Yeah, not a good thing to get your name in the paper. Our, some of our, fr uh, our friends, a friend of mine is actually um, somebody who's listening to an amateur radio operator in a foreign country when they uh, were having a, um, an overthrow of the government. And this friend of mine called a friend who is in the FBI and word got around to the State Department and he got a citation from that country for helping quell a, uh, a, uh, a military coup. So uh, somebody there got on the radio and just said, help, we got a problem. And, and the, the guy here in Illinois heard the signal and took action and got it fixed. So um, that global reach is really out there. It's something that can happen. Um, we, are, we require the FCC to make sure that we do everything legally, safely, and appropriately. They can, they can enforce the laws. I'm gonna tell you as a general property, the FCC typically doesn't. They have other problems in the world. If the FCC gets involved, somebody's going to jail. They have uh, typically it's when a ham maliciously 
and I say the word maliciously, interferes with a emergency services system like a police or fire setup. Um, they, they frown on that big time. Um, so yes, there are some, there's some repercussions, but typically we police our own bands and we do a pretty good job. Um, it's, it's something we take seriously. Steps to attain, we kind of went through this, study your stuff, the question pools in the back of that book, um, that's the questions that you're gonna look for. Here's some of more of those links, they're in the, in the page that I saw, show you before. So you can test on those. Your test is a 35 question multiple choice test. So out of that stack of questions in the back of your book, 35 of those questions will be on a piece of paper that has A, B, C, D that you fill in a little bubble sheet. You need to answer 26 questions correctly. It's 74%. So our statement is, if you miss nine, you're doing fine. If you miss 10, you're doing it again. So uh, when you're taking the test and you're panicking because you're getting one or two wrong, remember you can get nine incorrect. And the right answer is- Or if you wanna be really good, get a hundred on it. Yeah, we had a guy last, last session that took his technician test. I'll tell you, he's an OU, uh, electrical engineering prof, so that kind of helps. But he took his technician test and passed it 100%. He took his general test, which is another 35 questions, and he got one wrong. So it is possible to get them right. Now, if you miss nine or if you miss zero, you're still a licensed amateur radio operator. If, if you miss nine and you tell people, that's on you, not us. You don't have to do any of that. <laughs> You don't have to do anything. What do they call the guy that 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 uh, graduated last in his doctor's class? They call him doctor. Doctor. Yeah. Doctor. Yes. Yes. Have you ever asked? Did you graduate last in your class as a doctor? I wouldn't. That's not a good. That's not a good way to end that one. So, section one: licensing rules. FCC is the Federal Communications Commission. These stuff on here is is the stuff on these slides is there because these are good test questions. Uh, you'll see that what is the FCC and they'll have four goofy things. And uh, one of them is the Federal Communications Commission. Um, they parted, they, we talked earlier about part 97 of title 47, back to the lawyers. That's the code of federal regulations or CFR is what that's typically um, uh, stated as. And we call it part 97. There are other parts that are used for other radio systems. Part 90 is another one that's used for like a police radio, police and fire radio. They have different rules and regulations. And um, while, we, while we can use their radios, they can't use our radios. So it's, uh, it's a lot of legal stuff. But uh, as far as you're concerned, part 97 is all you need to look for. Um, we, we hit this one at, at, at nauseum on the, on the earlier slide. I don't know why they put two slides in here, but um, Again, we're supposed to make sure we do all this good stuff and uh, put out goodwill. We do a lot of, as a club, we do a lot of that stuff where we, um, we will go to Lions Club meetings and um, I've, I've talked at every meeting in, in Norman, I think that they'll let me come in the door. Um, amateur service, here's some definitions. Again, good things for the license. Test, um, amateur service is no pecuniary interest is the words the lawyers use. It's private, personal, and non-commercial. Now, big thing I want to say here is personal. Personal does not mean it is private. Private means non-commercial. Private doesn't mean that somebody else can't hear your business. So if you're talking on these two radios, if Lee and I are talking on those two radios, anybody within earshot can um, hear and decode those signals. We are not allowed to mask any of our communications so if you're talking somebody else can hear you if they're within range and they're listening on the same frequencies you are so keep that in the back of your head private does not mean i can't hear you private means you're not getting money for it and i know a lot of people that <clears throat> get spooked at the first part oh somebody else can hear me yep they can and it's just like talking in the middle of a parking lot. If they can drive by and hear you, same thing, it's on the radio. Amateur operator is the actual person 
holding the license or the authorization to operate an amateur radio station. So you would be the amateur radio operator and you would get an amateur radio operating license is how that is worded. The amateur station is equipment capable of transmitting on frequencies authorized for the amateur service. See how the legal guys get that in there? So definition one is the legal amateur service. So a station is anything that can transmit. Now, that means the wall of equipment that I have in front of me and that Lee probably has in front of him. Or that means the $25 little radio that you have in your hand. That Both of those are amateur radio stations as a definition. Mark, can um, I do something yep. here? Yep, go ahead. The, remember that chart earlier that showed you all the frequencies? Unlike all the other entities out there, the police department has just you know, like 10 frequencies that they're given. Uh, uh, you know, all types of businesses are given one frequency that they pay a lot of dollars for just being able to have that one frequency. We have thousands of frequencies open to us. And it's just because we pass the test. Actually, millions if you get up into the... Yeah, yeah, exactly. I lost you. Are you there now? Can you hear me now? I hear you now. Okay. Yep. I dumped my little batteries. Kicked them with my knee. Um, yeah, that's, and that's, we have a, a tons of stuff. Um, we'll talk about it later, but we have everything from very low frequencies like they used to use to communicate with submarines to very high frequencies like you use for your microwave and, um, and I mean, microwave oven and your um, uh, Wi-Fi for your, your, uh, computers, and we can actually put systems on our roof that will send data from one place to the other uh, with high frequency stuff in very high speed stuff. So it's tons of stuff that you can do once you get there. Um, let's see, there's the license, there's the examinations. I, I said earlier, Thursday, we are going to do a volunteer examination. VE, we are volunteer examiners. Again, no money. And, yeah. Yeah, and we will test I think we've got a half a dozen or so that are going to test tomorrow night. Uh, we typically run that here at Firehouse Number 7 over by the airport in Norman. There are other places across the world that do that, but we do it for free. The group that we does, do doesn't charge anything, and the club takes care of all the expenses. So that's kind of fun. Um, you, have to be, you have to have your extra license, the top little license, to do all of the, the testing. Um, and it's kind of fun to, to let the new people get in. So we will come make a class, or we'll make a test somewhere at the firehouse whenever it's convenient for you guys. Volunteer examiner coordinators, the VEC, that's the group of about 14 different groups nationwide that coordinate us volunteers. So those coordinators, they take our paperwork. So when Lee took his test, he turned the paperwork in, one of us volunteer examiners signed off that yes, actually three of our volunteer examiners signed off and said, yes, he passed the test. And then we transmit that electronically to a volunteer examiner coordinator. And they're the ones that come up with the uh, question pools and they, they come up with the content and they process all of the piece. So good things for the test is a VE and a VEC, volunteer examiner coordinator. And now I'm a VE. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that cool? See one, do one, teach one is what we always say. I guess see one, do one, teach one, examine one is probably yeah, the day. Yeah, that work. Yeah, we need to add that one piece. Um, we, like I said, we do this Thursday nights, uh, the first Thursday of the month. Um, literally, you are given the piece of paper. You sit there in a quiet room that there are three instructor, three examiners. Their main job is to make sure that you don't cheat and you do everything properly. And everybody that uh, has passed the test is really glad that, that uh, we keep that up so nobody gets in by breaking the rules. So we're there to make that happen. They're all multiple choice, literally dot, uh, fill in the dot and make it go. Uh, we have no fee. Um, other examiners have a $15 fee. Oops. They have a $15 fee and that goes to pay for printing all the paperwork and doing all the stuff. The club takes care of the fee and we work with a group that's 100% digital. So when you sign up on the web, it goes straight into the computer and it processes it all digitally. So there's no really expense in making that happen. The cool thing is 
we will take that test on a 6.30 on a uh, Thursday night. Um, Peter, our lead instructor, our lead examiner, will enter it into the computer. He'll hit a button and it sends it to a guy in um, Arizona. He will upload it to the FCC that night and you will have your license about 10 or 11 o'clock uh, on the same night that you take the test. Old guys like me took six and a half weeks back in the day. So you took the test and you waited for the mailbox for six and a half weeks every day. Did it come? Did it come? No, it didn't. So you will actually get your license that night. It's kind of cool. It be that people had to drive places like Dallas to yeah. get yeah. Once a month, they would drive. They, they had an inspector from the FCC used to come up to Dow, to Oklahoma City, and it was a very sterile environment and not a very good way to take a test. But that's all fixed. Licenses are free at this point. They are working on a cost based um, that every time you renew it or you get a new license, you will pay fifty bucks for ten years. So five dollars a year. I personally think that's okie dokie. I'm not happy that they're changing it, but you know, five bucks a year is cheaper than your, your driver's license. So I'm okay with that. They are good for 10 years and they are renewable 90 days before the expiration date. So if you see your license 10 years from now, um, you can start the renewal process 90 days beforehand. We will have, help you get through that or you can do it online at the uh, FCC's uh, website. Not a problem. So will they be, you know, if they're going to require testing again for renewal or is it just pay the fee it is it is just pay the fee um currently there's no fee but yes it'll, there's no testing to renew it if you wish to upgrade there's another test if you wish to go to one of the levels does that make sense yay uh, some personal information is required and again this is that cores address that i showed you before um we we don't want to handle your, your tax ID, social security number. So CORS lets you enter it into the FCC's website and they give you another nine digit number that is your FRN. And that's how you um, uh, are, are associated with that tax ID so they know who you are. Uh, current mailing address, you gotta have a mailing address. You gotta have an ID, um, so a photo ID when you take the test. So we know who you are, and we know who you say you are. Can't live in a post office box. Uh, uh, actually, you can put a post office box. Really? On the, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Used to be. It's a. Used to be you couldn't know. I can live in a post office box. Nope, 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 nope. Most of the folks, and that's that's a really good point, Lee. I'm glad you brought that up. They the the address that you turn in will become a public address. So it is publicly searchable on the, um, so if they, if somebody knows your call sign, they can pull up your address. If you don't wish to be known who, where you're at, that's a really good reason to get a post office box and uh, have it sent to the post office box. So but they cannot pull up your social security number. Correct. Nobody can do that. They can pull up your FRN, but that doesn't get them anything. That and $2 will get you coffee somewhere. But yeah, the, and that's why they come up with the FRN so that they don't, so you don't compromise that social security number. Um, up until I think a month ago, they would let us turn in a social security number. But as a group, we all said, we're not touching anybody's social security number. That's, we don't want to turn I it in. So, it. Yeah, I, I'd love to have it, but I mean, I, you better have a lot of money. Can I, I, can, your, can I have your pen as well? <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Um, so that FRN is what you need to go get that piece for. So you got to have an ID when you go take that. And there are, um, they're probably not on this stage. They're brand new. They're not on this list here, but there are two questions that they now ask. And there are, one of them is, are you, are you a felon? Have you been convicted of a felony? And um, the other one is, do you have any pending action with the federal communication at this time? So, the felony question is is more common than I guess I thought would be out there. There are a lot of things that, that are listed as felony items. Um, having a felony on your record does not preclude you from getting a license. It just means you need to explain what it is uh, and move through it. We've had uh, uh, felonies from, oh, you know, some somebody when they were a kid ran with Jesse James and, and uh, had something on their list. And we've had them from child support 
issues that you know somebody turned you in for child support problems and and uh, the fcc will um will honor those and let you still get a license you just have to fill out another piece of paperwork to make that happen i think they're trying to catch the guys this is really more for the commercial radio stations the guys that will start a radio station and then steal money from their um, advertisers get into felony and they don't want them to get a second license is, is what i think it's aimed at but it's the government we apply all the rules the same so a felony question you expect to see that one and uh, like i said it's not a big deal if it's there but we got to do paperwork and uh, the second one is uh, do you have any pending action with the fcc and i'm going to say none of us will have pending action again that's a commercial thing is that if you have if you're trying to get one tv station license and you have another one in process they want to make sure they they get them all at the same time so those are two questions that will be on the test. It's brand new, just showed up. Responsibilities of licensure. licensure. Um, you must prevent unauthorized operation of your station. That radio that you have is your property. And if you, if, you, know, if you give it to somebody and they use it in an untoward fashion, if they go out and transmit on a police frequency, uh, you could be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Wood, wood. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they literally, I mean, they've they've had fifty and and sixty thousand dollar fines for those. So uh, hang on to your radios. Um, you know, it's not something that we that we lock to our chain to our belts, but you know, you don't want to leave them laying around in bad places because you can you can do stuff. If if you're a good amateur radio operator, you can do stuff that you probably ought not to be able to do. Um, and then the, you must keep your personal information updated with the um, FCC. So they must be able to find you. So if you move, you got to keep your address updated, uh, kind of like a driver's license. And then the bottom one, which is one that always drives people crazy, is make your station available for FCC inspection upon request. So if the FCC gets a report that you've been a bad guy, you have to let them in um, to, your, to see your station. Uh, at that point, they will have the appropriate information from the judge, and it will be very, you know, it's not like they're going to knock on your door and say, hi, I want to see your stuff. Okay. They're going to have a, a court order that says they'll need to come in and visit you. I don't know anybody that's even been threatened with that. It's again, it's the guys that's maliciously, um, LA is, uh, Los Angeles is really familiar for that, where they have crazy people that um, transmit all the time and bark on the radio and all kinds of weird stuff or do you want to know anybody <laughs> right good point i yeah, yeah yeah very good point the fcc we we saw this before this is the uh the for your frn piece uh same the same online piece if you need to renew you can do it online there if you need to change your address you can do it right there um you can also search and you can find other people's stuff which is really cool if I know Lee's call sign, I can bing, pop up his information. And I can find out where he's at. We had a guy get in our, our Elmer night last night that was a call sign and he was actually from Indianapolis. So I put his call sign in and bing, I knew where he was at in, in Indianapolis. So kind of neat to be able to do that stuff. Uh, what can you do with a technician license? Do we need a break? I guess is, let's, are we good? Or we you want might to want to take a break, say so. nothing exciting okay um we will fall on feel free to break if you need to what can you do with a technician license um we saw the band plan and we'll see that more in the future the idea with the with the technician license is local stuff they want to make sure that you don't really transmit to italy so those long distance transmissions uh, are kind of limited now so we don't embarrass the uh, um embarrass ourselves amongst the national folks so think about local com communications they have new digital radios now that are really neat that you can connect to a um, a repeater or a radio station at ou we have one at ou and once you get your signal there it goes on the internet and you can literally talk to anyone on the planet um, if you want to bring up uh, we did one one time turned the radio on and brought up israel and you could talk to somebody in Israel. Um, you got to watch the time zone stuff because they're not <laughs> they're not in the same time that we are. 
But if you have a relative on the East Coast or if you have a family on the East Coast, West Coast, literally for a uh, $75 radio, you can um, talk the world. Kind of fun. I used to talk to a guy on a regular basis that uh, about five o'clock in the evening here and he was going for his morning walk in South Korea. And he had a little thing in his pocket that allowed him to connect up to his cell phone with his radio. And so he was walking in the woods talking to me. Yep. It's amazing. Uh, power rating is 1500 watts. That's the, the number we talked about earlier. That's the maximum power rating. You're, in the good old days, we had 100 watt light bulbs. That's the same amount as power is 15. 100 watt light bulbs, um, 1500 watts is about the same as a hair dryer. If you think about a hair dryer, so it, a lot of a lot of good power pushing out. One of the rules they state is that you're not supposed to use excessive power. You're supposed to apply minimum power. So if your radio has a high and a low setting, and you're talking to somebody, um, you might check to see if the low power will actually do it and use the low power signal. So we don't want to overpower stuff. We don't want to hit a nail with a brick. We want to hit it with a tiny hammer. Um, privileges, these are the different areas you can work. Next week, they will talk to you about uh, wavelength and frequency. That's the frequencies um, that you're allowed to use. And little charts listed there that shows the, the band. 80 meters is the wavelength. If you think of the wave, the electronic wave that's made, it, it bounces in 80 meters. So 80 meters is about 250 feet, um, somewhere in that range. So uh, that's the size of rate wavelength. A 10 meter is a smaller one. Um, the one that you usually see in your, uh, your little handheld radios are two meters uh, in wavelength. So that's the different sizes. The frequencies go up as the band, as the wavelength gets uh, uh, shorter. So a long band, a long wavelength has a low frequency. And uh, Phil and, and uh, Ron will talk to you a lot about that next time. This is that band plan that we talked about. So take a look at these uh, pieces. One of the special rules that we have is that uh, Technicians have uh, limits to make sure, again, that you don't cause problems. 200 watts on the bands listed, 80, 40, 15, and 10, and 50 watts on the, 20, uh, the 220 meter band, or 220 megahertz band, sorry. So those are special rules on the test is why they're here. So 200 watts and 50 watts, remember those two uh, power level pieces. <clears throat> what can you do with a technician license? Here we talk about band and frequency and, and wavelength. Frequency is in megahertz. You may have heard that. KTOK is on one megahertz, 1,000 1, on your AM dial. That's 1 million cycles per second. And if you do this math, 300 divided by the frequency, which is one megahertz, it means it's in a 300 meter band. So the wavelength is 300 meters long. Um, Phil and them will talk to you more about that, but that's the areas where we can actually operate in those things. Um, the, the, the privileges, the operating privileges of what can you do with the radio. So the first one is the band with where you can uh, do it in the radio spectrum. The second one is what can you actually do with, uh, with the signal. CW is called Morse code. Uh, Monday nights, we're actually running a Morse code class with uh, Edmund, oh, uh, uh, Auto, uh, FAA Center has a uh, code class running on Monday nights. Morse code used to be required for licenses. It is not required. Now that it's not required, there's more interest in Morse code than it's ever been. So if you're wanting to do Morse code, it's a lot of fun. Get another thing to go learn. Data methods we have where we can actually comp uh, talk computer to computer. Uh, we can send pictures, we can send data, we can do all kinds of things. Um, those are options that are available to you as a technician. So if you hook your computer to your phone, uh, we have actually used um, slow scan TV, um, which is a data method. Uh, the next one says image, slow scan TV. And it, uh, 
we took an image off of a, a uh, telescope and transmitted over one of the local repeaters. Mm -hmm. So we took the image at the museum down in uh, Norman, put it out over the repeater and people all over the city could get that image off of the radio and just listen to the tones and decode them with their own phone. So um, you can send data, which is kind of cool. Kids uh, love to, to see pictures go back and forth. Uh, Morse code we talked about. Phone is, uh, we, call, we call voice phone speech or voice communications. Uh, pulses is something that where you can put a little pulse out and put data on that pulses. Um, in addition to Morse code, the, the data pulses will let you oh, do everything from, from uh, like unlock a door signal to uh, uh, do telemetry for um, a bridge, a water under a bridge. So it'll pulse out the number of uh, feet that that bridge has water underneath it. Spread spectrum is one of the, the cool things that the military does. We do it also. And the idea is it breaks up your voice into a whole bunch of little pieces and it transmits it at different frequencies so that the bad guys can't find your signals. A um, lot of fun to do that. And uh, it, it sends the signal out and makes it harder for the bad guys to find it. Um, test is just you're sending the, uh, the signal itself and it has no information or no modulation, we call it. So the test piece is just to send out a, a, a single tone that people see here on the other end. Uh, primary and secondary ac uh, allocations. Some of the frequencies that we use, we are, are primary users and some we are secondary users. Primary means we have the frequencies to ourselves. Secondary users means we must avoid interfering with other users on the primary service. Um, some of the places that we have are in areas that have, are in frequencies that are used for weather radars. And if those weather radars are transmitting, we must avoid those radars. Uh, most of the spans that you deal with on a normal daily basis are primary users. So we can use them without having to worry about interfering with somebody else. And by somebody else, I mean, a fire department or a uh, commercial radio system. The secondary users are basically up in the higher frequency range when we're talking high speed data. And uh, we just lost a section of that um, frequency. Um, the three gigahertz range um, was actually lost. We were secondary users there and, and the FCC, Congress actually is the one that told the FCC we had to get out of there so they could sell that to the FCC, to the uh, phone carriers and make money instead of let us use it. So that's primary and secondary allocations. That's come from what they tell us we have to do. Uh, band plans. We have band plans that tell you how much, where you can and can't transmit. This is a voluntary arrangement. This is what we call, we used to call a gentleman's agreement, but it is a voluntary arrangement. And that applies to normal transmission pieces we break up our band in the following methods so that the Morse code or CW happens in 28, the 28 to 28.07 frequency range. So these are, are good things to, to remember or uh, watch the test questions to make sure that you know where things happen. Uh, this is what's called the 10 meter band. If you're a cb -er, the CB frequencies are just near this. They're on the 11 meter band. So they're, uh, they're just a little bit lower in frequency than these. But you can see where we have beacons. Uh, beacon is a radio transmitter that uh, runs 24 hours a day and you can judge to see how good the propagation is, what, what uh, Ken's gonna talk to you about. Um, so this is voluntary band piece. And the idea is to keep arguments from happening. So if I come in with my big slow scan TV signal and I put it on top of the Morse code section, the Morse code guys won't get mad at me. So if I, if I adhere to this band plan, I will get yelled at less is probably the way to say that. Have you ever gotten done something in the wrong band, Lee, and get them yell at you? Uh, no, no, oh, I have Good answer. <laughs> good answer. <laughs> I have. <laughs> yeah. They, and, I, and, you know, I almost did because Denny was telling me one morning about where he was talking to some guys uh, in VK land, which is VK land is Australia. 
and I wanted to talk to him, but I wasn't licensed to talk in that. Ah, yeah. So that's Denny's fault. I can see how that would be Denny's fault. Yeah. No, that's, that's, and that's the idea here is this is voluntary arrangements to make sure that we keep ourselves straight. So that's us uh, coordinating with our own selves. Okay. And, and with the word coordinator, we have what's called frequency coordinators for the, for the bands that you use on your little uh, handheld devices, the two meter and 440 bands, the UHF and VHF bands. You'll hear more about that later. Um, okay, I don't know what that's for, but good deal. Um, in these bands, we have local frequency coordinators so that we, when we put up a repeater or a radio system that will let you um, transfer um, audio from one radio to another, um, so that we all don't put them up on the same frequencies, we have a group in Oklahoma called the Oklahoma Repeater Society International or Incorporated, O-R-S-I, ORSI. And they actually coordinate those. They, they work through the FCC and the FCC says whatever that group goes. Now the bad part is that the Oklahoma group has to coordinate with Texas and Kansas and Missouri and Arkansas because if you put a repeater on the border, then you got to make sure that two states aren't uh, aren't getting the same repeater, so that we don't put two signal two radio systems on the same exact frequencies. So these frequency coordinators are elected by us, the local and regional amateurs. One of our members is a member of that board for Oklahoma, and they um, they coordinate all this kind of good stuff. So they're kind of like the referees that make sure that people don't put two systems in the same place and cause troubles. So those are frequency coordinators. International rules, we're getting towards the end, yay. Uh, ITU, International Telecommunications Union. They're the guys that, that keep all of this stuff straight internationally. Remember I said that our signals can go out and annoy the world and Lee said he talked to Italy. Uh, if we look carefully here, we are in uh, Oklahoma, which is in the center of region two. So we're in ITU region two and Italy is in the middle of ITU region one. So the International Telecommunications Union is the one that coordinates. Um, there are representatives from one, two and three and they get in together at meetings and they make sure that we all uh, have the same rules and laws and regulations that uh, we don't do something stupid like put uh, commercial radio stuff in the middle of an amateur radio band for a foreign country. Very important, but very minimal effect on our life. I'll ask a question that I, I've, had, I've had answers that shocked me. Has anybody heard of ITU regions one, two, and three before? <laughs> The, the reason, the, the, the chuckle part that I have is I had a lady that said, yes. And I said, how do you know that? And she said, well, I have an, a, a DVD player and each DVD player has to be set for region one, two, or three to keep copyrights from causing problems. So when you use a DVD player and you get a copyrighted disc from region three, it won't play in your region two player. And this lady wanted me to fix her machine so it, she could use bootleg copies of DVDs from Asia. <laughs> I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I would lose my license. But the ITU does those kind of things. So if you've had a DVD and you've had to set your DVD player, that's something that you might have seen in the past. Kind of a crazy way to make that happen. International operating authorizations. Um, this is something that's getting better as life is going on. Um, we, because of the ITU help, we have reciprocal operating authorities in uh, different countries. And we have a lot of our members that will go overseas. And because they have a license in the United States, they can get a reciprocal operating permission uh, in foreign countries. For instance, Mexico and Canada specifically, um, you do not need to ask anybody. You just have to uh, append uh, the location that you're at. So if you're in Canada, uh, there are six segments of Canada, VE1, 
uh, you'd have to do my call sign, which is N5HZR slash VE1. And uh, that would make me legal in Canada. Now, if you go to Turkey, oh, Turkey or uh, Singapore, you'd have to get some different licensing, but they will help you make that happen. Um, I, we've got a, a lot of members of our group that do that. It's kind of fun. Uh, this gives you the permission to work on US flagged vessels. One of our members is actually a electrician on a ri uh, drill rig in um, the Gulf of Mexico. So he can work maritime mobile from that uh, drill rig. And boy, a lot of people want to work ships out at sea. It's a fun thing for them to do. You can do that with the permission of the ship's captain. Very good. Yes. Yes. And when this guy told him, the ship's captain, that I'm doing communications that can communicate from here to shore, the captain said, you mean like a backup radio system and said it in case anything else failed? And she says, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Do all you want. Do, do whatever you want. <laughs> do whatever you want. She liked the fact that you can have a, a, a backup radio and it worked out well. Um, so you got to watch what you're doing if you go on foreign cruises kind of thing. There's a lot of hams that do a ham cruise. Well, back in the day before COVID, um, they'll do a ham cruise where somebody will bring a radio on board and they will get you all the permissions to actually work your radio from the, uh, from the ship, which is kind of neat. Gives you a lot of uh, exposure all across the world. Mm -hmm. Call signs. I said earlier, mine was N5, H, Z, and an R. The amateur radios have call signs with a prefix and a suffix. Prefix is the country of license. So good folks of the U.S. have N, which is my call sign prefix, or W, which is Lee's, or K, which is somebody else's, or an A. So you can go look these up. There's a neat app on, a, on the phone that will actually let you put in the prefix and find out where they actually come from. So the prefix is N5 in my case. The suffix is HZR. So the, that is assigned to me globally as a unique uh, number. There are typically two or three letters and numbers assigned by the uh, ITU for the prefix. In our case, it's N and five or uh, uh, N and four. The, 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 uh, the country is broken up into 10 spots, one through zero or zero through nine probably. Uh, Oklahoma's in the five call signs. So all the calls here that were generated here come with fives. Uh, suffix is just randomly generated. HZR is mine. A friend of mine that took the test right after me was HZT and HZU and all I of I changed mine to a vanity call sign and used my initials. Yep, he, he went and changed his. So there's the, the call sign areas. Zero is up in Kansas. Five is here in Oklahoma. Six is California. Seven is up the West. One, two, and three is jammed up in there in the part of the country we don't care about from Oklahoma. That's a different part. Whole other country. Um, and then Pacific and Caribbean possessions of the U.S. have special prefixes. Uh, PR or KP4, there's a guy here in Oklahoma City that's got a KP4 call that he got in Puerto Rico. Um, so Puerto Rico is KP4. Virgin Islands or KP2. Uh, so by knowing that prefix, you know where they're, where they're from. It's kind of fun to do it. KL is for Alaska and um, KH6 is for Hawaii. Kilo Hotel 6. So if you hear a KH6, Notice you know. Notice the ITU numbers there, Mark. Do what? Look at oh, the IT. Yeah, the ITU 61. Yeah. Yep. And ITU 10 and ITU 7. Yep. Those again are the the um, ITU assigns those numbers. U.S. has a bunch of different methods. Um, mine is N5HZR, which is what we call a one by three. The one is the N, and then the HZR is three. Um, Your initial call sign will probably be a KA5 something, 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 uh, or KI5, sorry, Kilo India 5 is where they're at on the random scale. And I think they're probably at I or J, KI5, J probably something, something is what you'll end up with. A two by three. So you have KI, the first two letters, and then uh, something random after that. We have one by one call signs, which would be like W5F. We had that as a special event for the weather festival here in Norman. And those can be assigned 
randomly. So if you want to pick one up for two weeks and have a special event, you can do that. So if you don't like your call sign for one week or for two weeks, you can go grab a W5F and use that call sign. And they're assigned by class. So the, the very first, the technicians will be the two by three. My first one was a, uh, uh, my only call sign is that one by three section. So they're assigned by, this, by the FCC first off. Lee, told, Lee said that his is a vanity call means he went out and, excuse me, requested that call sign. Um, it's his initials, there's the last three. So it makes it easy for him to remember his call sign. The rest of us just use the random one because we're smarter than that. We can remember our own, right Lee? <laughs> <laughs> um, call signs have indicators at the end of this with a, which is done in the words as slash or portable. I talked earlier about if you're working from Canada, mine would be N5HZR slash VE1 or you can say portable VE1. Um, those are those are allowable to say those kind of things. On Morse code, you would send the slash, da 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 da. Shave and haircut is the slash. Uh, typically people, this is probably back in the, the 80s, when you're operating portable or you're away from your home, the, people would say that they're operating po portable. Um, now, People don't tend to do that. They, they understand that they're going to be mobile. Back in the day, they weren't. Uh, mobile means uh, you're in a car, you're a vehicle driving around. Uh, typically, when people hear that you're saying N5HZR mobile, that means that um, it's probably more fun to catch a guy that's mobile on his signal, and they will jump on you harder to try to talk to you. Aeronautical mobile means you're in an airplane and that people always love to hear that. You'll hear a lot of FedEx uh, pilots that will be bored and they're ham radio operators and they'll tune over and start working the ham bands as they go uh, flying around the world. <coughs> or maritime mobile, like our buddy that's out in there in the Gulf doing his thing. Suffixes are also used called alpha golf, alpha echo, or KT. AG means that you have a temporary um, general. So if you have your call sign as KI5JJJ and you pass your general test, you will say temporary AG. And that means you're using your general privileges, but you don't have it upgraded yet. Typically that's historical and not for uh, actual use. The, the, we take the tests on a Thursday night and we get that passed uh, that stuff is posted by 10 o'clock that night. So that's only if you're going to operate between the time you take your test and the time the FCC gives you your new stuff. So uh, it, it's needed for the test to know that stuff, but it's not uh, really important to know about, uh, about the interim pieces. Vanity call sign, that's what Lee said. <clears throat> uh, Lee's call sign is one of those. He has picked that call sign. And technicians can have a two by three or a one by three. So if, if you find a call sign that's open, um, you can do that. And we talked about earlier with uh, the, somebody that had fathers and grandfathers and uncles and cousins that had previous licenses. You, once you get your license, you can do a vanity call sign and you can obtain that call sign back um, and operate as their call sign. So that's what's called a vanity call sign. Kind of cool. A lot of guys do their initials. <clears throat> uh, one by one call sign. We we used one here most recently for uh, weather festival. It's kind of neat to have a little short call sign, and makes it easier for people to uh, take notes or, or make contact information from that one by one call sign. W five W would be one or W five F, <coughs> and. They are temporary for a two-week time frame. And that's all we have for this night's information. Anybody have any questions that they have over the material or process or stuff? Feel free to ask. I just had one question. Um, Thanksgiving week. Uh, yes. I had to do it when, Wednesday night of Thanksgiving week. Uh, that's hadn't thought about that one. We're planning to go through that one. We could run it. We're going to record them 
So I'm going to say, if you can't make it, let's just uh, watch the recording and, and we'll, uh, we'll fog through because otherwise we'll hit Christmas at the other end is my fear. Yeah. I just think some people are likely to have family coming into town or whatever. 